I want to share some bulletin bloopers with you again this morning. These have been found in bulletins uh, in various churches. The audience is asked to remain seated until the end of the recession. The low self-esteem support group will meet Thursday at 7 p.m. Please use the back door of the church. The third verse of Blessed Assurance will be sung without musical accomplishment. Remember to pray for those who are sick of our church and community. Ladies, don't forget the rummage sale. It is a good chance to get rid of those things not worth keeping around the house. Bring your husbands. <laughs> Thursday night, potluck supper. Prayer and medication to follow. <laughs> I've got one more. A little boy opened the big family Bible. He was fascinated as he fingered through the old pages. Suddenly, something fell out of the Bible. He picked up the object and looked at it. What he saw was an old leaf that had been pressed in between the pages. Mama, look what I found, the boy called out. What have you got there, dear? With astonishment, in the little boy's voice, he answered, I think it's Adam's underwear. <laughs> All right, First Chronicles chapter 15, let's pray. Father, what a privilege it is to, to serve you, to love you, to know you. Lord, thank you for coming into each one of our lives. And Lord, we don't take that for granted. We, 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 we don't lose our first love for you. Lord, I, I just pray that uh, you would uh, position us to hear today whatever you desire to speak into each one of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I want to expound on last week's message a little bit this morning and, and give you a, a key. It's not a new key. It's something that we've talked about before, but a real key to breakthrough and to victory. And so by, by means of review, last week we saw in Acts chapter 15 that the church that was birthed in, in Acts chapter 2 was actually the resurrection of the tabernacle of David. Now what happened was in Acts 15 they were having a council meeting of church leaders because something phenomenal was happening. Gentiles were getting saved and like what do we do with them? You know what do we do with these Gentiles that are getting saved and, and the Pharisees who were saved felt like they needed to get circumcised, they needed to obey the law of Moses and was, they were trying to bring them under all of this legalistic stuff. And so the council was meeting together and and. and Peter began first by sharing the testimony of what God did in the house of Cornelius. You remember when Peter had a vision and, and, and really if, if God hadn't given him that vision he probably wouldn't have done this but he, but he basically said you know what, what I call clean is clean. Don't call unclean what I call clean. And some men are going to come go with them. And so they, Cornelius had, had had an encounter with an angel. God sent him to, told him to send for Peter. And so he gathered all of his family, all of his friends together because he, he wanted them to hear the words of life. And so Peter shows up, still not exactly knowing what's going on, and he says, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, and he begins to share the gospel with them, and the Holy Spirit fell on them, and they began to speak in tongues, they began to prophesy, the Holy Spirit activity began to take place, and Peter said, you know, you guys need to get baptized in water now. Because obviously God is, is not withholding this from you. Peter shares his testimony. Paul and Silas share their testimony of the, the amazing things that God was doing among, through them among the Gentiles. And finally James gets up and he says, you know, this is what was spoken of by Amos the prophet. Amos 9, 11, and 12. In the latter days I will raise up the tabernacle of David which has fallen. And I will restore it. And, and it, then it talked about how that the, the fruit of that would be the Gentiles would come into the kingdom. That's what it says way back in Amos. And, and James is saying that's why Gentiles are getting saved. This is God raising up the tabernacle of David. And, and, 
if you didn't hear last week's message, I, I would encourage you to get it because I, I really summed it up really quickly. We, we really looked at the scriptures last Sunday. But the significance of the tabernacle of David was what took place inside of it. Because, you know, on the outside, it was just a tent. Just a tent. But what took place on the inside is what made it significant. You know, the tabernacle of David was a, a, a tent with the, with the very Ark of the Covenant where the very presence of God, the, the Shekinah glory of God was manifested. The, the Ark of the Covenant was Emmanuel of the Old Testament. It was where God was with them. And, and, and it, when it was in the tabernacle of Moses, it was hidden way back in the Holy of Holies. It wasn't in the outer court where the priests were ministering or even in the inner court or holy place where the priests would minister. But once a year, a priest went beyond that veil into the Holy of Holies, into the very presence of God to offer sacrifice for the people once a year. But the tabernacle of David was so different than that. There was no rooms. There were no rooms. It was just a big tent with the Ark of the Covenant, the very presence of God, and everybody that, that was ministering to the Lord in worship and song. There were those that prophesied on trumpets and prophesied on harps. David introduced various instruments of music into Israel's worship, and it was happening 24-7. They were worshiping before the Lord. There were singers and, 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 and all of this worship going on. And what's interesting is during this time in the history of Israel, the boundaries, the borders of the nation of Israel extended to their greatest places during this praise and worship that was taking place before the Father. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but the tabernacle of David contained priests. Now, we discovered last week that we were all made to be priests. God has made us kings and priests. We, we are a, a, a holy nation, a royal priesthood. One of the amazing realities of the new covenant is the priesthood of all believers. You know, in, in the old covenant, there were priests that, that went before the Lord. They, 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 they stood before the Lord representing the people. They stood before the people representing God. They were in this unique place. But in the new covenant, we've all been brought into this place. We are all priests before God. And one of the main responsibilities of a priest was to bring sacrifices to the Lord. And what's interesting about the tabernacle of David was it, 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 it left that principle too. They, they, as David was bringing the ark to him, they offered sacrifices, but once the ark was in there, they offered no more animal sacrifices. Because it was a prophetic picture of the new covenant. And the only sacrifices that you found in the tabernacle of David was the sacrifice of praise, the sacrifice of thanksgiving, and just worship, this incense of worship going up before the Lord. But see, in the new covenant, we don't, we don't offer animal sacrifices because according to Hebrews, by one sacrifice, he has perfected us forever. There's no more need to offer blood sacrifices or animal sacrifices. But the sacrifice we are to bring to the Lord is the sacrifice of praise. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. And in that there is a release of God's presence into the earth. And in that there comes an extension of the kingdom of God into the earth. You know, if we really want to see this valley transformed, how many do? How many would really love to see God impact this city? Then one of the, the greatest things that we can do is become a house of praise. A house that, that, that praises and worships and honors God because there's something that, that has to do with the release of his kingdom that, that happens as a result of praising and worshiping and honoring God for who he is. That we become a people of praise. That I become a person of praise. Again, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. But this has everything to do with hosting his presence. Now, I want to look at a little bit of the history 
uh, of the establishing of the tabernacle of David. You know, it, it's a fascinating study to see how it came about. And I believe it will help us to further understand just what God is calling you and I to do in the day we're living in. If the church truly is the restoration of the tabernacle of David, it might be good back to go back and see what the tabernacle of David was. 1 Chronicles chapter 15, I think I asked you to turn there a while ago. Uh, verse 1, David built houses for himself in the city of David and he prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for it. Then David said, no one may carry the ark of God but the Levites, for the Lord has chosen them to carry the ark of God and to minister before him forever. Notice that word forever. 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 David longed to have the presence of God with him. He had prepared a place for it. He had pitched a tent to host God's presence. It was the thing that he desired most to host, to have God with him. But see, God had a plan in it too. And his plan was to reveal a foretaste of the grace of God and the new covenant that he, that he was going to bring into the earth. Now, the scripture I just read in 1 Chronicles 15, really I've kind of jumped halfway into the middle of this story because when David first decided he needed to bring the Ark of the Covenant to him, he didn't really read what the Bible said about how to get it to him. Notice this, this scripture I read. He says, it must be carried on the shoulder of the Levites forever. Well, he apparently didn't have that information or, or didn't remember it or something. And, and, and he obtained the, the, the finest ox cart. And he put the Ark of the Covenant on this ox cart and began the process of, of bringing the Ark into the city of David. And at one point, the, the, they, they encountered uh, some turbulent roadway and Uzzah reached up his hand to steady the Ark of the Covenant that was on this cart because it was going to fall and God struck him dead. Whew. Despite Uzzah's good intentions, God judged what was happening. And the principle is clear in your notes. The presence cannot be mishandled. The presence of God can, can never be ushered in by our best human ideas. It, 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 it can never be manipulated without consequences. I, I'm trying to say, if we're going to have God, we have to do it God's way. If we're going, going to experience his presence, we must do it in the manner or fashion which he has declared it is to be done. We must never try to fit God's presence into a mechanism designed by man. It just won't work. God will not ride on our ox cart. His presence will not rest on anything we make, any organization, any institution, any ministry. We must discover what attracts his presence. We must recognize his true resting place. God's presence was always meant to be carried on the shoulder of the Levites forever, forever. Only a priest can carry his presence. But because of the blood of Jesus, you and I are priests now. And we carry his presence. He lives within us. He rests upon us. We are New Testament Levites. We are the ones who carry his presence. And that's what gives us power to change atmospheres. Wherever we go, he goes. He goes with us. You know, I, I think about that. I say something like that, and I, I think, what an amazing privilege, but what an awesome responsibility, too. As I said last week, priests stood before God for the people, representing the people. But they also stood before the people representing God. They, they stood in the gap. They, they had authority to cry out to God for the people to intercede in their behalf. And God heard them and he responded. But they also had authority to declare to the people what God was saying, to stand in behalf of God. That's what a priest does. Whether you know it or not, that is who you are. That is what the new birth has brought you into. He's positioned you in a place as a new covenant priest to cry out for nations, to cry out for peoples, to stand in the gap, to release the mercy of God, to release the grace of God into nations, into peoples, into family, into France. 
And at the same time, he's positioned you to release heaven into the earth. He's positioned you to release what heaven is saying. To release the, the, the desire of heaven. Now, I, I want to go back to this thought about releasing his kingdom through praise. Because I, I think it is so powerful. Or, or inviting his presence to manifest through praising him. And I want to look at Psalm 149 in its entirety. But before we do that, I'd like you to turn. This is not in your notes, although I think I do have it on the overhead. I'd like you to turn to Psalm 67 for just a moment. I'm going to let you turn there. God, be merciful to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. Selah. That your way may be known on earth, your salvation among nations. Now catch the cry of this psalm. The cry of this psalm is that God would come and that his ways would be known and that his salvation would affect nations. Verse 3 says, let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you shall judge the people righteously and govern the nations on earth. Now again, let the people praise you. Let them praise you. And then he talks about what it looks like when, when heaven invades earth. The nations are, are glad and they sing for joy. And God governs or judges the, the, the earth righteously and governs the nations of the earth. And then he says, let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Then the earth shall yield her increase. Or in other words, that's, when, that's what will cause harvest to come. See, the, the, the harvest that a farmer waits for is, 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 is the, the seeds that they've planted. But our Father... Is, is a farmer also, and he's waiting for the precious fruit of the earth. He's waiting for the, for the latter rain, the, and the, the former rain and the latter rain to come and cause there to come a harvest. Now notice there, there's a connection here between God's, God being praised and, and the earth yielding her increase. God, our own God, shall bless us. God shall bless us and all of the ends of the earth shall fear him. And all the ends of the earth shall fear him. That's an invasion. That's an invasion of heaven and earth. I want you to see the correlation between praising God and his kingdom being released into the earth. For that to take place, darkness must be pushed back. For that to take place, enemy power must be broken off of people's life. How does that take place in praising him? We're going to find out in Psalm 149, starting with verse 1. You guys doing okay? Begins by these three words, and it ends by those same three words this psalm does. Praise the Lord. How many know that's good doctrine? That'll preach. You could find that in a few places in the Bible. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song, a spontaneous song of praise from your heart to God. And his praise in the assembly of the saints. Some of you need to know it's okay to sing in church. It's okay to make noise. Yeah, it's okay. The Bible says it's okay for you to sing in church. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. Now notice the atmosphere. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. See, the kingdom of God is, is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Let them praise his name with the dance. Let them sing praises to him with timbrel and harp. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. Can we just say that? For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. Now I, I want you to personalize that and say in me, okay? For the Lord takes pleasure in me. One more time. For the Lord takes pleasure in me. He will beautify the humble with salvation. 
Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their bed. Don't even wait to get up. The minute you become conscious in bed, begin to praise the Lord. Begin to sing praises to God. You don't have to wait until you, you've had your coffee. You don't have to wait until you get out of bed. Now, a, a powerful principle emerges in the next few verses. The theme doesn't change. It's still about praising God. But there is about to come an understanding of what takes place in, in spiritual warfare in praise. He says, let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the peoples, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron to execute on them the written judgment, this honor, this privilege, have all his saints praise the Lord. So what he's saying is, when you have the high praises of God in your mouth and the word of God in your hand, you have the power to bind the kings of the heathen, to bind the nobles of the heathen. We're not talking about natural kings. We're talking about principalities and powers. We're talking about forces that in influence nations that influence people groups he says there's something that takes place when you praise him that causes them them to become bound and and and, and you're, you're executing on them the written judgment this honor this privilege this joy is is for all the saints you all have authority through praising God, through worshiping Him, through declaring the truth of God's Word, of actually binding the forces of darkness. So praise the Lord. <laughs> That's basically what he says. He ends, starts out with praise the Lord, and then he says, let me just tell you what happens when you do it. So praise the Lord. You know, sometimes it's possible to have something that is more powerful in your possession than you realize. How many of you have ever shot a rifle or a gun that turned out to be a little more powerful than you realized? <laughs> like, whoa. I, uh, I inherited a, a shotgun from my grandfather. Never met my grandfather. But I inherited, inherited it. It was a Remington semi-automatic semi shotgun. And I went out with Randy Hendrickson. We were hunting up at the reservoir. And I had my shotgun. It was, it was a heavy thing. And, uh, and I was, we were shooting birds. And a bird went up and I shot it. And before I could get my hand off the trigger, it fired twice. <laughs> Freaked the living daylights out of me. <laughs> like, I don't need that. <laughs> Shotguns are powerful enough without it going off twice, you know. When I first got my driver's license, I, uh, I, I bought a Suzuki 80 CC. How many know that we're talking about a mean bike? <laughs> a Suzuki 80. And so I, I, I could still, I drove by the house that I, I bought, the guy I bought it from the other day, and I still remember trying it out in his yard. I'm 16 years old. You know, got my driver's license. I'm going to get a vehicle now. And, and I, I remember that summer, I... I, I went, I picked up Tim Collins. We, we were cutting onions uh, out in the field. And so I picked him up and worked. He hopped on the back of my 80cc. And, and I'd full throttle. And, and just get going a little bit faster. And, and then you'd have to stop. And then I'd full throttle it again. What's that? Yeah, that was with him at least doing that. And... Um, I remember I, there was a guy that, that I worked with, his name was Jeff, and he had a, it was like a 250. And I, and I, I hopped on, I said, let me ride it, and I, I you know, did the full throttle thing. <laughs> he never let me get on his bike after that. <laughs> yeah. 
sometimes you, you might have something that's just a little more powerful than you realize. And what I'm suggesting is that the praises of our lips are more powerful than, the, than we realize. In fact, it's something that God has ordained strength in that has to do with the enemy. Now, Psalm 8, verse 2 says, Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, <laughs> you have ordained strength because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. So God says there's something that, that, that out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants that, that, that you have ordained strength. There's something that God has given us that he's ordained to be a source of strength because of our enemies that has the power to silence the enemy and the avenger. Now, Jesus quotes that scripture in Matthew 21, 16 and lets us know what that is. He says, out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise. See, praise is what God has ordained for strength. He has set it in motion because there is an enemy. It has a power to silence the enemy, to still the avenger. The strength that, 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 that he's talking about, Jesus defines it as praise. Praise. Now, I just want to show you this in action, and there's so many different places we could turn to in the Bible. We're going to look at Acts chapter 16, but we could easily look at 2 Chronicles chapter 20. We could look at the time when Jehoshaphat, who was a king of, a king of Israel that, that wanted to serve God, that, that wanted to live for God, and all of a sudden he discovered that three nations had joined together and joined their armies together, and they were coming to destroy him. How many of you know that was not good news? You know, that can change your mood. And so, he, he you know, and, and especially since he was, he was one of the kings that was, was actually following after the Lord. Like, why is this happening? You know, and, and, and so he, he calls a fast and they're praying and they're seeking God and the prophet speaks and, and different things are happening and God gives them a strategy that is crazy in the natural the strategy is now, now the flesh the strategy of the flesh res was let's hightail it out of here so that when they get here we're not here we'll come back later but, but the, the strategy of heaven was get get the choir together no swords no shields no spears like the the armies that are coming they've got real weapons you know, and, and they get the choir together and just sing praises to God. Just sing praises to, to God and, and thank Him and worship Him and honor Him and, and, and declare His goodness and, and worship Him and praise Him. And, and so that's what they did. And when they got to the enemy camp, the enemy was totally destroyed. The enemy had turned on themselves and killed everybody. Now what was peculiar about this army is they were actually carrying the wealth of the three nations. Soldiers don't normally do that. Do you know what I mean? They don't normally do that. It, when Israel finally got there, everybody's dead, and it took them three days to, to plunder the camp. It took them three days to get all of the valuable resources. What the enemy meant for evil, God turned it around for good. The enemies thought they were coming to destroy Israel. What they were actually coming to do was give their wealth to Israel. But that's not the story we're going to look at today. <laughs> Acts chapter 16. You know the story. Paul and Silas are breaking into a new city with the gospel. Not only that, they're breaching a new continent with the gospel. It was a confrontation with new arenas of warfare against geographical principalities and powers. They were breaching a new continent with the gospel. And, and for the victory of the gospel to, to move forward, it would have to overcome this, this tentative but, but very real restriction. The preachers are in jail. 
Paul and Silas are in jail. Now, I just want you to imagine this with me. They had gone to this city under the leading of the Holy Spirit. If you remember, they were heading to Asia to preach the gospel. The Holy Spirit said no. Then they went to Bithynia. The Holy Spirit forbade them, Holy Spirit forbade them to go there. And then they finally get a vision of a guy from Macedonia, and they get this direction. So now they've headed out under God's leading. They get to this city, and Lydia gets saved, and, and her household gets saved and gets baptized, and, and they start going down to this prayer meeting, but there's this young demoniac girl that, that keeps following them and declaring, these are the servants of the Most High God. They've come to show us the way of salvation. Now, for some reason, it annoyed Paul to have the devil do his advertising. <laughs> and so he was annoyed with that, and he turned around and he cast that demon out of her, and, and her masters, who had gained much profit by that spirit of divination, she was no longer able to make any money for them. She no longer had that. And so they got all riled up, got the crowds riled up, and Paul and Silas end up getting beaten and, and thrown in jail. And, and they're sitting in the inner court, the innermost part of the jail. Their feet are in stocks. And the Bible says they, that they, they, at midnight, in, 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 at midnight, they began to sing praises to God in, in their darkest hour. They began to sing praises to God. In fact, let's just read it. Acts 16, verse 25. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. Yeah, I, I think praising the Lord is the thing to do when you're in captivity. No matter what kind of captivity it is. And the keeper of the prison awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. He knew that he would be accountable. He thought they'd escaped. But Paul called out with a loud voice saying, Do yourself no harm. We are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in, fell down, trembled before Paul and Silas. And he said to them, or, and he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when they had brought them into his house he set food before them and he rejoiced having believed in God with all of his household. How many have noticed that when the Lord was praised God showed up and his kingdom was extended? Very seriously, this morning, I, I say this to you, and this is in your notes. We need to understand the relationship between praise and the advance of the kingdom. The dynamics that resulted, not just the freedom of Paul and Silas, but the salvation of a jailer, his family, the, self, the, the establishment of a church in that city, later the spread of the gospel through Greece, and then on to, through Europe. There is something about praise and worship that releases the kingdom of God. There is something about when we're in a, in a, in a circumstance, in a situation, and, and we choose to lift up our hands, we choose to lift up our voice and praise him, there is something that is released. Your homework this afternoon is just to read Acts chapter 16. In your, in your own time. Now, I, I want to play a song, uh, and then we're going to look at a, a few more scriptures. But as I was taking a shower this morning, I, maybe that's too much information, I, 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 and I'm thinking about the message I was going to share today, and I, I remembered an old song by the Imperials. Do you remember the Imperials? It, <laughs> Davina's going. <laughs> it, it's really not just a motel. Um, that it's a song called Praise the Lord that I'd just like us to listen to for a moment and then I'll finish.
When you're up against a struggle That shatters all your dreams And your hopes have been cruelly crushed By Satan's manifested scheme And you feel the urge within you To submit to earthly fears Don't let the faith you're standing in Seem to disappear song oh wow wow I don't feel quite as old now <laughs> now Davina you've heard it too first Chronicles chapter 25 verses 1 moreover David and the captain of the army separated for the service some of the sons of Asaph of Heman and of Jeduthun who should prophesy with harps, stringed instruments, and cymbals. And the number of the skilled men performing their service was, and, and then it, you know how Chronicles is, it just starts going through. And then I, I went to verse 7, it says, So the number of them, with their brethren, who were instructed in the songs of the Lord, all who were skillful, were 288. David, in your notes, David implemented an order of worship that was unprecedented in the history of Israel. He introduced instruments into worship. There was a hymnal that evolved out of that. We know it as the book of Psalms. He understood the power of worship. And it's no accident that the boundaries of Israel reached their, their widest dimensions simultaneously with the introduction and implementation of the largest dimension of musical expression in its history. The manifestation of the kingdom of God as it was in that stage of redemptive history through a nation called Israel reached its greatest boundaries and, and proportions. They experienced their greatest victories simultaneously with the introduction and implementation of its largest dimension of musical expression of praise to God. 
I, I, that almost sounded like one sentence, didn't it? <laughs> what is the application to us? I believe that, that we're living in a day when there is a dimension of worship, of praise that God is introducing to the church. There is coming a, a broader understanding of the priority and power of worship. I'm talking about the presence of God that, that is welcomed by the worship of his people that begins to release the, uh, the, the life of the kingdom and, and release spiritual victories. In your notes, spiritual victories that are a result of the progressive binding of the power of darkness so that they can no longer resist the intrusion of the flow of the life of Jesus Christ. In your notes, he has given us song or he's given us praise as a means not only by which we may exalt him, but by exalting him, there may become a, a, a welcomed entry of his ruling power into the life of the church where he comes among us, where he releases his kingdom power in life. You know, we looked at this verse last week, Psalm 22, verse 3, but, but you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. When I learned that verse, I was, that was back in the King James days for me. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. God inhabits, God dwells in the praises of his people. He is enthroned in them. He comes and he sets up his throne. What does a king do from his throne? He rules. He releases. He does king stuff. Yeah. <laughs> love that king stuff. I <laughs> oh, mean, I live for that king stuff. I live for it. Let's stand together. I want to invite the worship team to, to come up. I... I just feel like it's appropriate for just us to just maybe sing the last two songs that you guys did and, and realize that when you praise God, things are happening in the heavenly realm. Now we're not doing it. We're not praising him so that will happen. We're praising him because he's worthy of our praise. We're praising him because he deserves our praise. But God is calling us, not, not just to a, a fresh appreciation of the joy of worship, but also to an understanding of its power and an application of it in our own lives. And not just a corporate application, but when you're on your bed, <laughs> when you're at work, when you're in school, you have the privilege of inviting God's presence through praise and worship. So let's just focus on him for the next few minutes. It's early yet. It's not time. <laughs>
lift up one song to a God, we lift up one voice, singing alleluia to a God, we lift up one voice, to a God, we lift up one song to a God, we lift up one voice, singing alleluia.
us a house of praise make us a people of praise Lord we surrender ourselves to you thank you Lord thank you Jesus thank you Lord As we praise, um, we're lights right here in Walla Walla. And as we're praising and we commit to our praising, he's going to send it out. The warfare, his word, everything. This light is all about Jesus. Jesus is the, is the answer to all the things that are going on. I actually see it worldwide. I'm seeing it's big. So as you can continue, he's going to break strongholds in every one of you he's going to bring release your praises are where the releases are coming from for your your personal experience for what's going on in our community and what is going on in the world you are just to, to continue praising just feel the feeling now every day every moment praising praising he will bring he will bring your peace and he will bring our peace and we will be able to live in peace and he will be able to set us all free earlier when dave was sharing one of the things he said he was talking about the um, tabernacle of david and i just thought it was so interesting something just struck me he said you know it was just a tent and tents look different what really happened was what was going on on the inside and so as we're worshiping, we're praising God, you know, all of our tents look a little different. 
But what God's looking at is He's looking at what's going on on the inside, and we celebrate that, and we invite that. And so, God, we just thank you for what you're doing. Yes. And so when we worship, when we praise Him, that's where we're looking. We go, so God, thank you for what you've done inside me, Jesus. through me, and in my life, Lord. I want to make myself available to you, because, Lord, I love you so much. Amen. Good. Just feel like we should just wait before the Lord for just a moment longer. Thank you, Jesus. Pastor Dave, I also feel that we can extend this. And as um, we're concerned about Israel, we're concerned about Iraq, we're concerned about the United States of America, sing over them. Sing songs yeah. of deliverance over them. It's going to have a breaker effect over these countries. We need God to take over. So see, when you're worshiping and when you're interceding, for these countries, sing over them. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Honey, this morning when we were worshiping, I kept seeing a mighty wave of God's glory coming, and I, it keeps coming to me to share it that you know a mighty wave of God's glory is coming and God it's on the horizon of time yeah. and God has looked down through history and he's ordained for it now and he yeah. said the glory of the latter house shall be greater than the former there is such a wave of God's glory that is coming and it's rising up in the hearts of God's people and it's going to splash upon the earth and it's going to change everything yes. so let's not be discouraged let's not look down but let's look up because our redemption is drawing yes. nigh Of your glory come. Let the wave of your glory come, oh God. Oh, Jesus. something about praise and worship and his presence now I know you wish you could have Jack and the band just travel around with you all week <laughs> while you walk through all your stuff but he's probably not able to do that but you got Jesus and you can be a praise band anytime anywhere Thank you, Father. I'm going to invite the, the, what are they called, the prayer people? <laughs> prayer ministers. I want to invite the people to come up here, the, the, the prayer teams to come up and be, be available to pray with people this morning. The benediction I want to share with you is out of uh, Revelations 1. It's actually the same benediction that, that I had last week, but I believe it's just, it's so apt to what we've been talking about. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Yes. Amen. God bless you, saints. I, let me just say one more thing. On Tuesday nights, you know, I've been 
doing this thing where we've been watching IHOP live, which has been okay, but I just long to have musicians playing here so that it's not just IHOP live, it's us live. So if you have a heart just to come and, and soak in the presence of God and just enter into a time of praise and worship, prophetic song, just inviting God to come, intercession, all that, all that flows in that dimension. Just want to invite you to come on Tuesday nights. Bring your uh, banjo or ukulele or juice harp, whatever you got, and come and be a part of that. God bless you, saints. Have a wonderful, fruitful praise-filled week.